about um, more theatre-based practice and related issues. And then I do think we'll still have, by then, sort of three quarters of an hour of open discussion and, and tying up time. So we should be OK, and we'll all definitely finish by five. But we'll use the blog and Twitter and other forums to continue discussion, hopefully, if things are sort of live for you and of, of real interest. So Richard Bezo, we're really delighted that he's here, his kind of institution in the Northern He's been a London-based artist for many decades, around in the scene and an important figure for many of us working in performance over the, the years. I'm affiliated to ResSEM, which is a kind of arts-based um, project at Middlesex, so has a link with the, with the Academy, and has shown work really all over the world. Um, he's an active member of an arts community called ACME in the East End of London, and started showing there originally... He's curated all sorts of time-based projects, um, initiated the first UK artist directory. He's been employed, really, by the Arts Council to work on um, video work. So his work spans all sorts of different um, mediums and uh, modes of, of production, I guess. He's going to talk in some detail about a couple of his own projects. I'm not going to describe lots of, of his work, but he's also an author of a book called Cream Pages. Is it really called that? It's really cool. Lovely title, Green Pages and Enhanced Performance. And uh, is a sort of an associate artist with Red Sun. So we're really honoured that he's here. It's absolutely great. So it's first Simon and then Richard and then some discussion. Okay, thanks. Um, so what I, in, hopefully in 15 minutes I want to do something just really super pragmatic. I want to whip through a kind of range of what we're calling social practice projects from the 1970s. And I'm kind of interested in they're kind of canonical projects, some are quite major, some of them are quite minor. And I'm just really interested in sharing with you kind of specific techniques and sort of tactics, strategies, ways of working, especially with images and kind of mediating materials. So the kinds of things that artists are asking participants to do in these kinds of projects um, and the ways that they're going about sort of structuring extended interactions. Not a lot. Some of these projects are, they're all durational within a kind of artistic frame. If you think of a, of a theatre performance that lasts three hours as your regular duration, then an event that lasts six weeks is massively durational in art terms. Uh, but some of these projects go on for several years, as we'll see. So I'm kind of going, I'm starting sort of in the 70s um, <coughs> with Stephen Willats, who is of a kind of little known but I think incredibly influential uh, artist. Uh, and a project of his, very much interested in this notion of social sculpture, social practice, um, kind of way before his time in a way. Uh, West London Social Resource Project was a sort of really a kind of seminal work of his at the beginning, which took place in sort of four London boroughs uh, and was a kind of an attempt to engage with the everyday life of four diff very different demographics in a sort of West London area. And the, the main part of this involved in producing these things called the uh, West London Social Resource Project manuals, which were kind of like, almost like satires on market research questionnaires. Uh, and they produced kind of very a dense combinations of images and questions and prompts that people had to then fill out. Yeah? And then these books had other versions that were like day books. Um, and so here you can see some of the, the kinds of questions uh, and things that were set up. Um, the whole thing about tennis supergirls, sort of fic kind of fictional uh, questions around uh, sort of idealized figures in the, in the community. Yeah? Uh, questions around uh, photographs. Um, this is a two-car family, what kind of lifestyle do you think they attach to their owners? How does this Tudor feature relate to the social standing of the occupants? Um, because this is my favourite, I think my favourite questionnaire filled out of all time. It says, describe what social physical needs your front and back garden fulfills. The answer is front, a place to park my bike, back, a place to park myself. <laughs> Considering the needs your front and back garden fulfills, draw, describe, make a map of what alterations you can make to them. Elizabeth Taylor's swimming pool, complete with Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> now, this doesn't, for me, doesn't conform to, to a standard notion, notion of a questionnaire or an interview. Um, but it's, these packs were literally distributed through, through doors, and then people would then go around and say, did you get the pack? Are you interested in collaborating with us on this project? People would say yes. Uh, and then they went through six weeks of engagement with this kind of work, which was then displayed in public libraries. Uh, in, I think this is a, now this is a really interesting format to think of, these old, very old-fashioned boards, and all these responses collated in public libraries. Um, I always like to look at notice boards in public libraries these days, because you kind of get a feel... <laughs> for what's kind of going on, even though it's a kind of totally antiquated system 
of representation, they're still used, and they, they're almost like a sort of little geography of themselves. So that's West London, so that use of this use of a kind of alternative form of questionnaire. Um, this is a very well-known work, Touch Sanitation Handshake Project by um, Mieli Lukelis, which has been going on, is still going on in some ways. She became like the artist in residence unofficially at the Department of Sanitation in New York City. Uh, and her first, uh, sort of self-appointed, and her first act was to physically shake the hands of all 8,500 garbage men. So I think they were only men employed at that time. Um, and to have a photograph taken of each of them, and then she would greet them saying, thank you for me keeping New York City alive. Um, so this was her mode of interaction. She went to meet um, uh, the men in their incredibly decrepit and almost totally unhygienic uh, for sanitation and it's quite interesting premises where they had to work. Um, that project then mutated into various other kinds of things, including one in which she painted the, uh, the walls of a gallery, the outside walls, the windows, with all the names, the bad names that they'd been called, the sanitation men. And there was a ritual ceremony in which the names were washed off the windows, the names, the insults that the garbage men had, had handed on to them sort of through the, through the decades. Uh, so this kind of, this, this, hand, this handshake is a kind of exchange, the use of, of that as a symbolic moment, repeated over and over and over, as a way with engaging with the totality of a population, uh, I found interesting. Um, third one. Roof is on fire. We're moving slowly through the decades uh, into the 90s. Uh, Suzanne Lacey uh, kind of really invented the term new genre public art. Again, this is a really a kind of seminal work in the sort of social practice, social sculpture uh, genre. Um, in the city of Oakland, uh, uh, riots, summer riots, on a, a bit like the ones we had in London, but on a smaller scale in 1993. Uh, a lot of tension between youth gangs and the police. So as an, as an artistic project, uh, Suzanne Lacey and her collaborators uh, began to work with the police and some of these gangs uh, in process of negotiation and discussion and almost like arbitration. Uh, the, uh, this particular part of the project, this piece was called The Roof is on Fire, which was staged on top of a multi-story car park in which all the members of the, of the gangs who'd been recruited for the project sat in parked cars and had discussions about the issues that were, had affected them or their views on them, which you could spectate upon. Uh, it was also televised and broadcast live as a kind of, um, sort of live documentary on a local television network. So a kind of theatrical staging of a kind of point of social tension between two different communities. Again, this project had mutated into other kinds of versions. The next one was called No Blood, No Foul, which actually involved a basketball match between the police officers and the, the youth. Uh, <laughs> but a, not a normal bucket match. Uh, the referee, they had different, uh, sort of, in each quarter they changed the system of refereeing to having no referee, to having children of referees. Uh, there were films shown in the interval and kind of dance troops would kind of invade the pitch at certain uh, points. And it was a kind of structured, anarchic kind of confrontation, really, a stage confrontation between two groups who really didn't get on and, and were in... In, had been in decades of confrontation. But it was the beginning of a kind of uh, a process of um, meeting, a kind of a, a meeting. Uh, Suzanne Lacey is now sits on the Oakland City Council as a, as a member of the council, as a sort of artistic advisor. Um, smaller project. This is a very cool project by um, Nikki S. Lee. The Taiwanese American artist. This was her like graduation work. She was very young when she did this. Very simple thing. She basically began to. Um, she went out to meet particular communities, subgroups in her area of New York, and basically inveigled her way into a kind of friendship relationship with them. And therefore, she began to then remodel herself uh, on their dress styles and fashion sense and music tastes, and would have these kinds of snapshots taken of herself with them. They're, they look very natural but they're incredibly sort of artfully composed and staged. So it was a kind of photographic collaboration with different constituencies over a four-year period in her neighbourhood. So in this one, I don't know how you describe, I don't, I don't know the scene, but you, you could get a sort of feel for it. It's kind of Latino, uh, the Latino scene there. This is some older retired ladies, and this on the, that's her on the, the right. Um, um, yeah, okay. So I think this, this kind of thinking about intervention 
and the, the, research, or the artist researches his own subjectivity. And being absolutely unashamed to make that the central aspect of what you're doing. Obviously, that's very counterintuitive, I guess, from a social science point of view. But I'm just thinking about the kinds of potentialities that it does unlock. I'm including this one because, in a way, it's a sort of... Santiago Sierra is like the bad boy of the international art scene. You can sort of rent him to do something really outrageous, <laughs> which he's done hundreds and hundreds of times. This one was at the Venice Biennale in 2001, involved him paying uh, illegal migrants who sell uh, knocked-off leather handbags on the pavements their, annual, their daily wage to have their hair dyed blonde. Uh, and to wander around in the desert. These photos are not actually his photos, they're like tourist photos that were generated out of the project. Um, so his, the, what, what, he, what he takes away from the work is really nothing other than it happened. Uh, and he's, I guess the, most of his work is around a kind of over-identification with exploited labor. In a way, his work is about how the art market in some way is complicit in... Um, in the labour market and the exploitation that goes on in the labour market. But why sort of I'm including this is that for me is that it generates some interesting kind of social knowledge. Yeah, these people who are supposed to not exist, not be there, suddenly appear en masse as a collective, yeah, through their own through a through a process of, of exchange, yeah, it's money. Um, and a, a reiteration of a kind of exploitative labour process, now repurposed for art. Um, and I think, for me, there's something interesting in here around issues around confrontation and antagonism that we often tend to shy away from in kind of research. And that this, I mean, this work constitutes it out, out itself entirely out of this kind of, these tensions, antagonisms, <laughs> confrontations. So it's three minutes. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to skip to the end then. Okay. Um, How many more? Let me just do this one. Um... So Jean Nu, a Capemont of Mass, a French group, which is an artist, a sociologist, and an architect, who won a competition, for, I think it's the Swiss Foundation, to do some kind of community-led project uh, to do with architecture. Uh, and so they chose the area where they had been doing some previous work, which was called Sevran, it's the outskirts of Paris. It's a kind of where each wave of migrant population will show up. Um, uh, very old tower blocks, very sort of run down, and they, their proposal for the area to the, all the constituents was that they would build a place of solitude for thought in the park. There was only one park, uh, and this was their model for it. Uh, and then they engaged in a kind of extended forms of kind of outreach with various kinds of uh, populations there, producing videos and these T-shirts in which they got people to print up things that they'd actually said in their interviews on their T-shirts, which they would then wear around town. Um, to sort of mark out their participation in this, in this venture. Um, uh, they're still looking for money to build this thing, so it doesn't actually exist. There's, this, there's 2000, it's actually still ongoing, and I kind of hope that someday it will be realised. Yeah? So the kind of longitudinal is getting longer and drifting into the future. Um, this last, give me two minutes after this. Shops project. This is really simple, I really loved it. I don't know why I like this, it's very, very simple. French Mottis Head, a British duo. It's, the basic idea is that you, they go to a town, it's usually associated with, there's usually some kind of arts festival on, they get invited, and they approach various <coughs> shopkeepers and they say, um, can you persuade as many of your customers as possible to come back tomorrow to have their photograph taken outside your shop? That's it. And then you, they create a kind of ethnography of the, of the town, the city, through these kinds of photographs that are signed by the people who show up on the next day. So you get a kind of sense of which shot, uh, a kind of alternative demo demographics through people's allegiance to the, where they shop on a regular basis. So you see some shops where literally hundreds of people come back and some where none come back. Uh, so you get a kind of very different sense of a, of a place, of a location, through this very, if you like, contrived and artificial method of working with photography, yeah. Very different from giving someone a camera and say, go and take pictures of whatever's going on for you, yeah. It's very directed. But in a way, that, for me, it's the very directed nature of it that actually produces interesting data, yeah, if we, for want of a better word. Um, so my main points out, main questions, I don't have any answers to these questions, they're just my questions. Um, do these projects produce meaningful sociological knowledge? For whom? What do they bring, what do they make visible that might not be achievable by other methods? 
what do they reveal about the explicit or implicit constraints and possibilities for other forms of social practice and research, including QLR? And how might sociological social practice speak back to this kind of work, which is maybe we can get into that later. The things I want to draw out from these, this kind of work more broadly, which I've really sped through, is social practice as the staging of new or existing social relations. So rather than trying to look at what's there, it's making things happen in social space yeah, and being unafraid to do that and seeing that as, as much as intervention as observing something, yeah? uh, but acknowledging it and using that self-reflexivity as part of the process. Um, symbolic vis actual practice, different kinds of things where you might, for example, like the Bejure a New project, are they actually going to build that thing or is it just a fiction? Yeah? Some kind of ambiguities around what is the aim of the work? Is it really just to gather a set of conversations and interactions or is it really to build the structure? Yeah. Uncertainties around that. Some practices very operating purely in a symbolic space, it's just about producing an interaction and some kinds of things we might call actual practice, which is actually about making things really take place, real, real other things happen. Uh, I hope we can see complex forms of participatory image-making, um, different ways of working with the photographic medium, uh, a positive role for artifice and pixelization. I think that's pretty evident from, uh, again, kind of, that's the kind of thing that's also something that's taboo in other types of situations. Playfulness, the kind of role of irony, playfulness, obviously really important in a lot of these works. <coughs> and the place of the artist researcher's own subjectivity, sometimes off to the one side and barely visible, sometimes absolutely the focus of the work, and moving between those kinds of positions and being unafraid to do that. Uses of confrontation and antagonism. Uh, I talked about that earlier. I think an idea that somehow that, that the people we... What's the role for, for confrontation in situations of where you're working with participants and communities, yeah? Is, it always, is, is there always a lawful empathy and an uncritical relationship with one's research subjects, yeah? What's the space for confrontation? Is there a space? Is it possible? Um, and that relates to this other question about empowerment versus critique. I mean, is the research as well to empower, to emancipate? Um, or is, is there another, are there other possibilities? And what are the ethics of that? Um, my competing frameworks thing is really just about where's the money coming from? Mm -hmm. Who's it, who is it? Who is the work for? Yeah, and the, the, and competing uh, answers to those kinds of questions depending on who uh, who is you know where the money is coming from and the kinds of economies one is operating in and who's one ultimate audience is in because often for a lot of these works which take place in art space there's two audiences there's the audience there's the participatory audience and there might be another local audience, but then there's the audience of the art market, and then there's, then there's you as another kind of audience to this work for me showing you here. So there are multiple kinds of constituencies in which, at the, at the work's origin, it's already aware of those, yeah? that, that it's going to be circulated and be seen within those other, other kinds of constituencies. That's it. I know.